Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. This is episode two of our Premier League podcast and we are talking about who we think is going to get relegated. I'm joined by Paul Tierney, Gary Curran and Peter Henry from thefootballfaithful.com. Is it footballfaithful.com or thefootballfaithful? Thefootballfaithful.com. Just making sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, well, Peter, you know, we've had you on. We, you, were, you were already on. We were talking about the race for your, the European spots in the Champions League. Um and you've done up all the stats and figures on your on one of your articles. So do you want to give us kind of the lowdown? We're going to go work our way from Norwich up to, say, Brighton. And we'll probably go through the, the remaining fixtures, what points yeah. the clubs are on. And we'll kind of go in that order. And then at the end, we can kind of come to our conclusion on who we think is going to get relegated. And who we're excited maybe seeing coming back. Something like Aaron Connolly or, or someone like that for Brighton. But we'll get into that when we come to the clubs. Yeah, so it, it very much looks like a, there's six teams embroiled in this um, interesting race to beat the drop. Um, Norwich, Norwich are, are six points clear of safety on 20, 21 points, but then Aston Villa in 19th and Brighton in 15th. There's only two points separating Aston Villa, Bournemouth, Watford, West Ham and Brighton. So... It's there's definitely going to be uh, nervy fans from those clubs. I think we'd all kind of probably say Norwich are going to go down. Listen, they they've played some good football. Timu Puki story at the start of the season was was very entertaining, and probably one of my favourite games all season was actually when they bet Man City, but they just concede too many goals and lose too many football games. So I'm not really going to count them as a team that that will avoid the drop. 19th place, um, Aston Villa, they currently sit on 25 points. And I think it's safe to say they have an absolutely horrific run in over their remaining fixtures. They have Sheffield United, Chelsea, Newcastle Wolves, Liverpool, Man United, Crystal Palace, Everton, Arsenal, and then West Ham on the final day. Um, yeah, definitely an interesting one, this lad, because they, they spelt over 100 million before they came, when they came up. Um, they've had some players that have been highly praised, but they just haven't been getting results. I've watched them quite a few times. They seem to play well and, and you know, concede a late goal or whatever it might be. But um, I, I, I personally, I, I think they're in really big trouble. When you look at that run in, um, the fact they're already in the relegation zone, it's, it's going to be tough for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I actually went to see a Villa game, Villa Norwich, um, over Christmas, and they only have like one style of football, and that's get the ball to Jack Grealish and let him do whatever he can. And the days that he's been marked out of her, there's only so many fouls he can get, and they have to do things with it. I, I think they've been really disappointing. It's a kind of a Fulham 2.0. When Fulham came up last year, they splashed the cash and just threw their money everywhere without thinking about who they're getting or what they're buying or how they're going to fit in. And it's just another case of that. And Villa look really, really, really poor for the whole season. They never really got any sort of run going. And in fairness, as much as I like Villa, I, I, I enjoy watching Villa. And I do think they're one of the traditional Premier League teams. Um, they deserve to go down and they deserve to to learn from this and, and get rid of some of those players. And, Unfortunately, I think they'll be they'll be doing very well if they can uh, if they can keep Jack Grealish as well. So who knows when we'll see them in the in the Premier League again? They've just been so so disappointing to watch. They're all over the place defensively. I mean, like you said, there's a couple of players there that can do it. Like Mings has had an okay season. Grealish has had a good season, but like Wesley's been poor. Marvelous Nakama never got a berth into the team. You know, McGinn obviously the injury to McGinn didn't help at all. Maybe if they had him back, it might have worked a little bit better. But they can't just be relying on one or two players when you come up and spend. You spend a hundred million you have to be relying on 11 players you can't be just relying still on one or two and that's what they were doing it's it's, it's, it's real disappointing to see you know them go down because I, it'd be very surprised if they didn't and like you said um peter that the the fixtures that they have is not, it's not good regardless of home and away not mattering with the pandemic and stuff like that it, it's going to be very very tough for them to come out of the of the of the bottom three but I'm holding out hope because I am a, a bit of a soft spot for Villa, and obviously Conor Horahan being there as well. Would love to see him stay in the Premier League and um, and take his spot in that Villa Villa squad because he's been on the fringes as well. So it's just one of those ones that it, I'd be very surprised. I'd be very very surprised if they can if they can pull off a relegation miracle. But it looks like Norwich and Villa are, are dead certs, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, Paul, if you kind yeah. of look around the rest of the teams, there's obviously Bournemouth in there. Um... Then you have who else have you got? You've got Bournemouth, Watford, West Ham, Brighton. So 
Peter, do you want to pull out or pull up uh, Bournemouth's remaining fixtures? Um, and we'll kind of talk about them as we're as you're kind of doing that. So you know, Bournemouth, you look at them, they've 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 really struggled, and you know they've all they've often tried to bring in players like you look at Solanke, you look at um, oof, who else have they kind of brought? in? Jordan Ibe was poor signing. You know he was bad. You know when Wilson's and Wilson's not. Ake Ake's probably been the the biggest sign that's been good for them. Whereas yeah. you're looking around the business, their business hasn't been great. And the players that they brought in, you know, even in the goalkeeping department, I mean, they're switching keepers every week. Um, you, you look at their you know, mainstay players. Ake is a very good player and could play for a much higher team, I think. But in and around the rest of the team, you've got Brooks, Wilson, uh, the Welsh lads. Um, Cal- Callum Wilson's a good player, but he's not amazing. Uh, you're looking around. They're pretty much a championship standard squad. If you're looking at Bournemouth, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think with Bournemouth, um, they rely a lot on Callum Wilson and Josh King. And Josh King had that one good season a few years ago, and he hasn't really replicated it since. Um, if you look at Bournemouth, it's kind of a similar situation to when Huddersfield were in the league as well. They're kind of just delighted to be here. I know they've been there for five years, like it's a long time now for a club to stay up, but um. They were nearly in the National League not too long ago as well. So, I mean, it's probably inevitable they're going to go down eventually. It's just who they are, the club they are. And as you said, championship standard at the minute. Yeah, I, I do. I would disagree slightly with you there. I, I think one of the reasons they've struggled this season is they've had a horrific injury um, list. I do personally think that, you know, sometimes this fairy tale story of Bournemouth coming up. There's no doubt Eddie Howe has done a great job, but I feel like everyone wants Eddie. Oh, you know, in the English media, they want Eddie Howe to be, you know, the the great white hope of English managers. But it's not as it's not really a fairy tale story. Like they ba- they bought their way up from this League Two, League One, the Championship. Every year they went up, they spent the most money in that division. So it's you know, it's it's not like they've you know the way the media would portray how they came up sometimes. I know they kind of came from, from you know, nearly being relegated to non-league probably just over a decade or two ago. But as well, probably one of my favourite players to watch last season who they've been without this year is was David Brooks. I just thought he was technically just brilliant. It's kind of skinny fella. Kind of reminded me, a, a different player, but reminded me a, a little bit of, of Mares. Just so good to watch when he when he had the ball on his left foot and um they, they're another one lads they've a really really difficult run in um the, the average the average position of their remaining uh opponents is is eighth so they have crystal palace wolves newcastle man united spurs leicester man city southampton and everton so they're basically playing either clubs in and around the top six or the traditional top six in half of their remaining fixtures. Um, that's going to be tough for them. I, I Yeah, I, I'd probably lean that they might just get themselves out of it, though, because um, th- there are a couple of other teams there that that have even worse run-ins than that, you know? Yeah, like uh, like I'm looking at like um, Brighton there and even Watford and, and, and Bournemouth. They all kind of have a similar team or squad or anything like that and I, I think out of the the three of them there I actually think Bournemouth can can come out of it I think they, they, they do have the players and like Brooks is back from injury now he won't be thrown straight in obviously because he had a long term injury uh, Ryan Fraser has been in and out of the team as well with injuries and stuff like that and hopefully he's back in fit as well because they do have actually have some good players as well there and some really good structure with Lerma in the middle and then obviously Harry Wilson uh, banging in the goals and hitting their set pieces and stuff like that and the two lads up front like no they're not the best strikers in the world are they top 10 Premier League strikers in and around maybe but like I think there's enough there for them to stay up I do I really do like Nathan yeah. Ake is a good player but there is if they can get it if they can get a couple of games right um, and look they're playing tough game after tough game after tough game so it's not going to be like it's not going to be it's going to be kind of like they're going on a steady path of are we going to get a result here and there are they on that kind of path of we have this is how we're going to stay up or are they just going to get are going to lay over and get bet and I, I actually do think that they they can nick a few results here and there because they are there's, there's, there's players in there that are good enough and I would disagree with you Paul that they're championship standard I, I think like they've spent money they've spent some money stupidly but they have players in there that if they go down a lot of teams will be will be swarming to, to grab a couple of those players off that team Fraser's actually refused to stay on. 
He's refused to play on, has he? He's refused to play on from the yeah. So his contract's up on the thirtieth of June, and then he's done. Okay, so Bournemouth are going down. <laughs> <laughs> he's been terrible this year. To yeah, be he fair, has. yeah, he has. Yeah, a reason why they haven't played well. You know, I, I don't know if other clubs were in his ear last summer, but he's been a shadow of the player that yeah. was, you know, right at the top of the assist charts in that last year. But he, you know, he's one of them. Has Arsenal, been. I think. Sorry, Gary. There was talking oh, going to Arsenal as well. Like, yeah, there's been a lot of like. Not big chap, but kind like oh, uh, he's linked with Arsenal, you know. So maybe that was getting to him as well. You don't know. Yeah. You look at like the top championship clubs like Leeds, West Brom, when those sides are coming up. Like if Bournemouth went down, a lot of those players would move we'll to stay those. In the clubs, you know? Yeah, 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 the the next year. yeah, yeah. Well, those two in particular, like just mentioned, like you know, Fulham as well. They're up there. I think yeah, no, Paul uh, is and they wouldn't be... have to go too far if they went to Fulham, you know. But it's yeah, the championship. exactly. It's all nice. <laughs> Yeah. Um, like, like, even sorry, even Paul, even looking at the likes of Norwich and Villa, like there hasn't been um three teams that went down that have had such good players in a while. Now, obviously Fulham last year after spending a hundred million, but none of those lads looked any good. Even Mitro- Mitrovic had an okay season last year. He, he kind of kept them in the running towards the end, but there was nothing really, and he's obviously in the championship now. And I thought he'd be the first to go, but he's still at Fulham. But if you look at like Norwich. Um, obviously, they have Cantwell and they have the two wing backs there, Max Aarons, and they have a couple of players. That you get. And Pookie, of course, could could play for another one of those teams that come up out of the championship or or a lower level Premier League team. But Villa as well, obviously, Jack Grealish is going to be on the move. Mings won't stay there either. They have too many players on on their on their wage list to, to to let that team be in the championship and Bournemouth as well. So it is it's going to be really 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 interesting to see those teams that do go down and even the teams ahead of them, Watford, West Ham, and Brighton, like they all have some really big players in there that won't be sticking around. I I think with like, I think they're all all the sides that they're all extremely similar. Like like well maybe Brighton they they struggle to score a bit more than the other sides, but they're two points clear most of them, and um, it's 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 very tough to call, very tough to call. I I, I think Brighton are in real danger, lads. Um, yeah. they they've been in terrible form in twenty twenty. I don't think they've won a game yet. They have a pretty tough run in as well. It's it's Arsenal, Leicester, Man United. That's the first three back, right? So you would say realistically they'd be lucky to get much out of that. Zero. Norwich, Liverpool, Man City, Southampton, Newcastle, Burnley. Um, I think I think Brighton are in big trouble. Uh, there's no doubt that you know they they went for a new departure from the more kind of agricultural style of of Chris Uton to bringing in Graham Potter, and he's obviously a talented a talented coach, but um. I've watched them a few times and like, like you said, they just don't look like scoring goals. Like the first 15 minutes you'll go, oh, these are a good team. They're kind of playing the ball around nicely. But then you're kind of going, are they actually going anywhere here? Is it possession for possessions, you know, uh, for possession's sake? Um, and I think with that first three run of games, Arsenal, Leicester, Man United, they're going to be really up against it if they lose them three games. They'll be in the relegation zone after that. And uh, I just don't see where the spark comes from in that Brighton team sometimes. Who's going to turn around and kind of, you know, grab a game with a scruff of the neck or, or go and, and, and score score a winner for them? Um, and I think there's a lot of other teams in and around there that, that do have players that when it, it comes down to it might be able to do something to get their team over the line. Um, I, I, I just don't see that with, with Brighton. I, I think they're quite easy, easy to play against. And... Uh, yeah, they're they're definitely on on they're in a horrific run of form before the break. So unless they they really change how things uh, were going from before, I, if I'd put money on them, I, I'd probably I'd probably back Brighton to go down, which is bad news for Aaron Connolly and Shane Duffy, obviously. But um, well, it could be bad news um, if if you know Jason Malumbi as well if they do go down. But I think the rest, like I mentioned in our, I think it was in our other podcast, is. The, the rest could have done players like that. Like Aaron Connolly's back now for them. Not that he's like this amazing striker, but I know he wants to get back at the score sheet and he's very hungry to do so. Um, and then kind of looking around the rest of the team, they do create chances, but they probably just don't score enough goals. But I, I, I still think they're strong. I think the, the team that could be in real, well, it could either go either way with them is West Ham. I mean, you look at like, players like Brighton and I'm sure a lot of their players are really really close in that squad whereas you look at West Ham and you think of their team and it kind of seems like a lot of prima donnas in that team and 
are they all playing for the club? Whereas I think the Brighton players would be. And as good as a manager as David Moyes is, and I know some of you might not agree with that, but I do think he is a good manager. Um, I, I, I think he has a tough job on his hands trying to keep the players there happy because... Um, there is such a mix. Like they've got, but like if you're if you're looking out of all the teams in that area, they've got by far the best squad, mm. West Ham. Yeah. You know, but have they got the best uh, team spirit, the best harmony? Have they got that? And I don't believe that they do. Whereas you compare, it, I think Villa probably a, a better team spirit. Um, probably lacking it a little bit. But like West Ham, they've like I know this is before, but you know. Looking at the last, I think, five games on the Premier League website here. Draw, loss, loss, win, loss. You know, so they're not doing, like, amazing either. Um, and with Brighton, it's been draw, 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 loss, draw. So there's obviously been too many draws for them. And that's what they need to do now is turn the draws into wins. I, I think the problem with West Ham was it started when they moved into the new stadium, the London Stadium, obviously. Like... You could look at it as if they've kind of lost a bit of their identity as like, oh, you go to Upton Park and you get a tough game. Whereas like you can go to this new lovely stadium, fantastic pitch. You're not getting stick off the fans as much because they're a bit further away from you. So, I mean, I think this has been coming for a while for West Ham and they were, they were in the championship uh, in 2012 as well. So it's not too long ago. And I think they've kind of moved away from what we know West Ham as is like, producing these talented young players, them coming through and playing. But instead, they've gone on and bought like players such as, like, for example, like even bringing Snodgrass in over maybe giving someone like Josh Cullen a chance to play, you know? Yeah, it's, it's crazy with West Ham. There's just been so many m- mistakes there. Like, even when they had David Moyes there before, the, on the short-term deal a couple of years back, they let him go because he wanted full control over transfers. He wanted to take that away from, you know, Sullivan and Gold, the Dildo brothers. He didn't want them signing, <laughs> signing players anymore. So, um, but what they did in the end was they brought Pellegrini in and the, Pellegrini, I can't remember the guy's name, but Pellegrini brought in his own, his own director of football and they just spent a, a load of money on players that you kind of look at a lot of them and they're kind of fair weather players like Felipe Anderson, capable of the odd kind of, you know, moment of brilliance, but probably, you know, won't be up for a lot a lot of games. Um, having said all that, I do think they've got, like they have by far the most talented squad um, of any of anybody um, around that bottom area. And they do have the easiest run in as well. So David Moyes, you know, obviously he's neither as good, you know, he's not as poor a manager as a lot of people make out sure. and he does have a bit of know-how around the Premier League. So I, I would take the point, uh, you're definitely right that they wouldn't have the best harmony or they've signed a lot of kind of prima donnas, Paul. I wouldn't dispute that, but I, I think that they've enough match winners and probably David Moyes has enough savvy just about to get them over the line, considering they have a, a kind of easier run of fixtures than most. Okay. Yeah, they kind of they kind of remind me of that. Uh, they kind of remind me of that QPR team a couple of years ago. Remember, mm. like mid season or the sure. season before they got relegated, they were splashing all this cash buying like Remy and Cisse and all these boils, and uh, they ended up going down. But I do feel that West Ham obviously are are they just have too much big players, too many game winners, and and there's a lot. What what the main point is really is that there's actually teams around them that are way worse off, and they don't have those players. They don't have that Felipe Anderson to, to pop up with a with a goal out of nothing or or Fornals or Lanzini and stuff like that. And you know, they spent forty million on a striker in the summer, and he hasn't really hit the heights. But if he gets three goals in the next or four goals in the next three games and wins them a game or two and gets them a point here or there, then that that forty million is looking great because they're staying in the Premier League. So they do have that. They do have the the cash. I think really talks, and it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna talk over the next eight games. And I do feel it'd be a big shock even with everything that's gone on, that if West Ham do go down, there's just there's, there's too much there's too much for them to lose and, and too much money in the players. The players are better than most of the other players in the squads around them. It'd be, it'd be very surprising. But like I said, it happened to QPR a couple of years ago when they splashed the cash and still went down. So you just never know. Yeah, it's it's like it's like Stoke as well that year. Like, well, Stoke was coming. They they went away from like oh Rory the lap long throw to buy in Shakiri, Arnautovic, Ibrahim Afaloy, all these like players who might you know do a bit of magic every so often. It's it's just seems like it's similar for West Ham, but I agree with you. I don't think they'll go down. I think they might just just stay up. 
I think St- uh, Stoke's biggest fault, and I know Gary will agree here, is they saw Glenn Whelan. <laughs> they saw Glenn Whelan, <laughs> and they went down. That's what it's all about, lads. If if any of these teams can get Glenn in on a pre-contract, they're staying up. <laughs> It's Champions League spots for them next season. He just improves the morale of the dressing room. And the he, does, he does. He does it all. He does it all. As soon as but, the playoffs finish for Fleetwood, he's going to be going to West Ham or someone like that to finish off. And he has the legs for it. He can play in the 10 if he wants. Let, let, <laughs> let's finish off, uh, obviously, with Watford. And I do think it has to be said that the incredible job that uh, Pearson has done since he came in there. I remember going to Vicarage Road earlier on the season to see Watford against Arsenal over in London for a weekend. I went to see them. And they, I think they, at that point, they had their first manager in, then the second one came in, uh, Flores, Kike. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a crazy game. 2-2, two, two, was it? Yeah, yeah. they should have yeah. won it as well. They should have. They should have won it. Yeah, they came from 2-0 uh, down. But um, I don't think long after that, the manager got sacked. And then the manager after that got sacked. And they just looked like they were absolutely like nailed on to get relegated. And the job that Pearson's done since he's came in, like, they even beat Liverpool, the only team to do that this season. You know, having Troy Deeney back has been a huge factor for them as well. But I think I, I, I would I'd actually back Watford to stay up now, regardless of their fixtures. I just think that what they've done, um, some of the players that they have are, are really, really good. Sar, De Lefeu, I would have known, obviously, following Everton. And on his day, can be as good as he wants to be. But it's how often does he have his day. But when you got the likes of Troy Deeney up there bullying defenders, and if anyone can bully Van Dijk, they can bully any defender in the league. I think that's what they kind of need at this point. But, uh, Pierre, do you want to give us their remaining fixtures? Uh, and then we'll kind of go into how we see them fared against the others. Uh, Paul or Gary, do you just want to... Let us know what kind of how you feel on, on the job Pearson's done since he came in. I, I think he's done a, a great job. I think all this with Watford stemmed from that hammering in the cup final at the end of last season because they had a brilliant season last year. Even in the cup semi final, they were 2 0 down to a what you would consider a better Wolves side. But I think it's all stemmed from like conceding six in a cup final is not good. It wouldn't be good for the, the confidence for all the players. You mentioned Dale Lefeu. He, when he does it, he's brilliant, but how much does he do it? Uh, they rely a lot on Deeney, and Pearson's like sort of a drill sergeant. If, you know, he's coming in to save a team who's like nailed on to get relegated, he's going to he's gonna give it a good go. Obviously, he'd done it with Leicester in the year after they won the league. So, I mean, you know, he's, he's a top manager, top manager. I agree 100%, absolutely. Pearson was the perfect man to come in for that job. What I've read and heard about Pearson, he's a really positive, he relies completely on positive energy and he's a very happy-go-lucky man. He's a very good man-manager. And I think that's exactly what Watford needed after the the, the, the amount of managers they've had over the past couple of years. He really is uh, one of these people that will come in and, and tell you how great you are and you know it'll be it'll be easy for the players to kind of to play for him because he, and he's passionate and he loves football and you, can, you just know that by him. And, and uh, he was abs- he was a perfect appointment for them, and they're playing they're playing for the manager. You can really ca- you can really can't see that, and I'd be very surprised if uh, if they don't if they don't stay up because it, you know they've just beaten Liverpool. They were coming into a good run of games for themselves, and obviously form isn't going to come into it at all anymore because it's completely different. But I think I think Watford are, have been brilliant since Pearson's come in. And he's got them ticking and going again, and all the players look like they're really enjoying their football, and that's the main thing, especially when you're looking at teams around you and, and the likes of Villa and Norwich and Bournemouth. They don't look like they're enjoying themselves at all. When you look at Watford, who are a point or two ahead of them, they look like they're enjoying their football again. That, that's enough. That's enough to keep a team up, and I think Pearson's done a great job to, to, to give the players a lift and lift the club and lift the fans, and I think they will stay up. Yeah, I think you. I to, to I, he's definitely done a great job. But to paint Pearson as this kind of happy-go-lucky chap, like, <laughs> you know, this this is a fella who tried to to strangle someone on the sideline who kind of has gone crazy. We all, we all have had him in an ostrich as well before. Yeah, I, mean. I think he's. I think I think more than anything, than positivity, he'd bring a fear factor into that squad. Um, which I think the likes of Troy Deeney and stuff would would react well to. Um, you know, I think he's a very he is a he is probably I don't think it's fair to to paint him as this kind of dinosaur or whatever, but he is he's a hard man, but he is quite progressive, I'd say, in, in a lot of elements. And yeah, a very good appointment for Watford at the time because when he'd left Leicester, it kind of looked like no one was 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 going to go near him for a while because he kind of left under under a storm. Um, the, the year before they won the league, but you know, like, as you were saying, he did a great job, kind of 
well, you can say he did a great job keeping Leicester up, but it was him mm. who kind of got them into that situation. Yeah, first true, true. Um, yeah, no, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. Like they're, they're in 17th place now and 27, 12, 27 points. They're, they have Leicester, Burnley, Southampton, Chelsea, Norwich, Newcastle, West Ham, Man City and Arsenal. But I, I think just, you know, in terms of just kind of at this stage of the season when you need kind of a bit of steel and to grind out a result. I think Pearson is the manager. I think Troy Deeney is, is the perfect man for that, you know, as a leader within that group. I think absolutely that Watford w- w- will have enough to stay up. Um, they did a very good bounce when he came in. Um, and I think a lot of us kind of remember remember that bounce as what they were like before. But in reality, they'd only won one of their last seven before the break. And that was actually against Liverpool. Um, which I think we we all re- remember quite well, but um, yeah, the, if you just look at, you just look around that squad, even in terms of the kind of physical players, the Corre and and Eddie and Capir they have in the centre, um, I I'd, and even Ben Foster experienced head and goals. I, I I think they have, I think they have everything they need to kind of just get as many points as they need over over the next few weeks, and yeah, they. I, in many ways, I put them down as one one of the the least likely to go down out of all these teams. I will say that I stand by my statement as painting Nigel Pearson as Buddha, so I'm going to go with that. <laughs> I think it was his wife who wrote that, wasn't it? <laughs> I called him a drill sergeant, and you called him Buddha. Yeah, I'm telling you, <laughs> difference. No, I'm just saying because any of the players that have spoke about him, or even when he speaks, like he's not the greatest media man. He doesn't seem to like doing that press stuff, and Anthony. Sometimes he can come across a bit. You know, silly is the word that you're looking for. Sometimes yeah. the stuff he says, but uh, any of the players that talk about him, or any of the managers, or any, 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 but anyone who, but they always say like you, you can just see that he loves football so much, and he's he yeah. loves just chatting about it and stuff like that. And I think for a team in a, in a relegation battle, that's exactly what they need. You know, they don't need this 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 fella coming in and and not really not not caring, but like not really knowing how to handle the players. And I think Pearson can do that quite well, whether it be Troy Deeney or a younger player like you know Sarah or any of those boys, because he's got them going. In fairness to him, and like. Yeah. The two lads said, and even you, Paul, you probably agree that I don't think Watford will go down either. He's a Buddha, okay? Leave him be. <laughs> okay, well, let's not harp on about Pearson too much, whether he is what he is or he is what he isn't. Um, <laughs> predictions on who will go down. So we, I'll just kind of run through um, the, the played games and the points that people are on. So Norwich are bottom with 21 points. Villa are second bottom on 25 points with a game in hand on all the other teams above them uh, and Norwich. Um, Bournemouth 29 points or sorry 27 points but 29 played uh, Watford 29 27 as well same as West Ham and then Brighton 29 games played 29 points so they've basically drawn every game by the looks of it <laughs> but that's, so who, uh, that's, gonna, that, that's basically go down, who, who do you think out of, out of those teams will get relegated I think um I think I said it earlier. I think no. I, I think that the three that are in the bottom three at the moment. I think they're more most likely, in my opinion, to go down. I think Brighton will scrape it. I think West Ham will just about do it. I think Moyes has enough Premier League experience, and we've obviously spoken about Pearson and the job he's done, and kind of why I'd back him to to keep Watford up. So that's my three. So I'll bring it over to you, Paul Tierney. Right. Well, my one's going to be a bit controversial. I'm going to go Norwich. are going to finish twentieth. 19th is going to be Bournemouth and 18th Brighton. I just think Brighton, they're not scoring, they're letting in goals, not keeping clean sheets. It's just inevitable. Bournemouth, I think it's it's time. It's time for them to go down. And Norwich, I think it's done already. Gary Curran. Um, I would say Norwich, Villa, and Everton, I'd say, will probably go down as well, to be honest. <laughs> 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 no, I actually do. I think it's I think it's a toss up between Brighton and Bournemouth. I think Bournemouth might just nick it, but I, like like the boys have been saying, I just think Brighton are they're too weak. They're they haven't played well. They don't look like they're going anywhere, and I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm going to go for those three: Brighton, Norwich, and Villa. Peter, yeah, I'm the same. I'm Norwich, Villa, and and Brighton. I I just don't see how how Brighton kind of turn games around when, when they're they're not in, you know, when, when they go a goal down or whatever. So, um, yeah, that, that'd be my three. What about you, Paul? I, I gave it to you already. I wasn't listening. Am I messing? <laughs> <laughs> I said the bottom three as they are. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Norwich, 
Villa and Bournemouth. Maybe not in that order. Maybe maybe Bournemouth could finish lower or Villa. But mm. the three of them, I think, will get relegated. So so that's really been it for, for episode two. I hope to continue this weekly now, um, this kind of series of Premier League videos. We might even squeeze in a European football show. Um, why not? But uh, for, for, for anyone listening, um, make sure to check out the Footy Faithful. Um, Peter, feel free to, to plug it away where you can find it. Uh, what socials is it on and uh, your website as well? Yeah, no, we're on all the all the major socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And yeah, the, the main place that, that all the action is happening is on the website, thefootballfaithful.com. Um, all the latest Premier League news, nostalgia, podcasts, you name it. So all your, all uh, the the most relevant Premier League content and then content and then a lot of kind of older nostalgia stuff. We love a bit of nineties at the football Facebook for it, so there's loads of that on there too. You can see that on your shirt. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I had a Paul McGrath on the last time I was on, remember Paul? <laughs> yeah, he did. But if, you might remember Peter from he was on our all time eleven uh, series, so you might remember him from that if if you're a returning subscriber or watcher or listener. Um but uh, yeah, don't forget to check out um, the rest of our videos, the rest of our content from this week. There's lots of stuff going out from the road to glory. Absolute limbs today uh, from Ireland versus Poland, myself and Gary. Um, if you haven't checked it, check it out. And then uh, there was obviously I had an interview with Pat Huben, and then we had our other episode where we spoke about the race for the top four. So make sure to check all them out. Don't forget to like, subscribe. Follow Paul Tierney, Gary Curran, and Peter on their socials. And you can follow me if you don't already. And we'll speak to you all soon. Thanks for watching, listening.